Hey guys, hey. what's up? Haru. In my humble opinion, 4.2 Archon Quest is honestly the best Archon Quest ever, portrayed in the most dramatic show by the Archon of Opress. And the three biggest stars of that show are, in my opinion, Posalor, Porina, and Nuvolette. This video isn't a recap of the quest, but a sort of deeper look at all the main characters of the show, how they all fit together and come up with the best yet bittersweet ending in all of Fontaine history. Today we're going over Arlecchino and the Commedia dell'Art Harbingers' intentions, Egeria and her primordial sin, Posalor and her grandest opera, the prophecy and how cruel yet miraculous fate is, and finally Nouvellet and Forina's crucial role in the biggest show of all time, Masquerade of the Guilty. Timestamps in the comments as usual, but before we start, a quick word from our lovely sponsor, Genshin Star. Genshin Star is an official fan-made merchandise store, and since they're licensed by Genshin Impact themselves, you know they've got the good stuff. Now since Christmas is just around the corner, Genshin Stars prepared these Christmas advent calendars that are not only on sale but are already running out as we speak. Every advent calendar includes 24 doors which represent each day of December 1st until just before Christmas Day. From each of those 24 doors, you can get ornaments and trinkets like visions, plushies, lanyards, weapons, keychains, and maybe something special like this Paimon painting or Xiao's mask. Of course, they've got a ton of other special items that you might like, and when I say a ton, I mean a ton. So if you want to support the channel, go check out Genshin Star and use my coupon code ARU8017 as well as clicking the link down below for 10% off on your orders. Big thanks to Genshin Star, now on with the video. In the short screen time we get of Arlecchino, she's already managed to secure a pretty good reputation within Fontaine, helping Navia in Poisson, indirectly having child fend off the all-devouring narwhal, and assisting the people of Fontaine during and after the flood, which is exactly how she secured the hydronosis that contains the remains of the third descender, which they probably know about already. She's also likely the main way for us to get into Sneznaya. Not saying that we're not welcome there, but Sneznaya seems more volatile than other regions. And it doesn't help that Child fell into a hole to the Abyss in Sneznaya, as well as Squaramosha's initial missions to go to the Abyss when he was a Harbinger. Her interaction with Charlotte also makes it very clear that Harbingers aren't to be messed with when it comes to press releases. Having to go through lots of papers just to get a single photo means that it's rare for them to be seen in the news, which is kind of true since a lot of what we hear about the Fatui and Sneznaya are rumors or hearsay from other people. Arlecchino also discreetly shows her true nature as a Zani, emphasizing her own character as well as other Harbingers' roles within the Commedia dell'Arte. Masks and faces that change depending on the situation as well as switching their priorities if the opportunity arises. Just as she says after we ask about keeping her position as our ally. Well, that depends on many things. No one truly knows what the future holds. What good is honesty if you can't rely on it forever? Just a quick highlights on the siblings here, and the fact that we see them giving out magic pockets after Fontaine's been saved, as well as Linny's words on fate and serendipity. In today's society, we often hear things like, make our own fate or carve a path of your own. But we seldom hear things like, this is what fate has led me to, or this is the path that I will tread. As someone who grew up in a religious household, we often believe that a higher entity is guiding us to our destined path, and all we need is to play our role, which I think is highlighted here in Fontaine. But I like seeing things from different perspectives and then create my own once I think about it. So we may sometimes think that we carved up a trail on our own, but maybe we were supposed to simply realize where our own trail should be, and then simply follow that trail. Of course, I don't speak for everyone, but it's how I see things and how I read into my own life. The pockets are still the pockets, and if fate is real, then everyone's fate is theirs to find. Egeria, after being created as the new heart of Fontaine, committed the grave sin of making humans from Oceanids. Humans, if you can still remember from the book Before the Sun and Moon, yes, that book is still prevalent today, humans were created by the Primordial One and the Shades, specifically one of the Shades, maybe the Shade of Life. Egeria's Oceanid familiars wanted to be like humans and to experience what it's like to be human. But even though water is intricately linked to the power of life, what it could not do was create human life. So Egeria then infused her Oceanid familiars' blood with something that she shouldn't have. 
primordial water and created pseudo-humans by using the primordial sea without the heavenly principles' permission. This is similar to the legends about the Oceanids' creation stories. Oceanids were given a quote-unquote thing by their elders or the Hydro Archon. Humans refer to this as a helix split, but this was theorized to be a drop of water, a sound, or a permit which grants their desires and dreams. And so they became humans. Also, the saying that the primordial sea creates and takes life, now I would think is primarily creating life, since Fontanians don't dissolve anymore. The thing I want to know about is why Fontanians don't remember being created by Egeria. If an event like that occurred, shouldn't it be remembered or at least be recorded for everyone to remember? It's a plot hole that I think could be easily filled up by saying it's because of erosion, which is the slow decay of memory. But judging from how they were created and because, well, their oceanids, I think there's more to that. We still don't have a proper visualization of this happening, and we don't even know what Egeria looked like. So hopefully we see and learn more about her and what else she knows about the heavenly principles' fate. To deceive fate, you must first deceive yourself. I think there should be another quote to this. And once you deceived yourself, you can then deceive the world. This is exactly what Fosalor planned for Farina to do. And Farina did exactly that down to a T. She separates her divinity, Fosalor, and her own body, Farina, so the world can see Farina as a god, while the heavenly principles still sense her divinity as an archon on herself, instead of Farina. And by doing this, she can also separate the punishment that was meant to be carried out to Oceanid humans and the Hydro Archon in a way that looks convincing and accurate to the prophecy preordained by Celestia. You might be wondering why Fosalor had to sacrifice herself for Egeria's sin. Technically, it's supposed to be Egeria's punishment, but it was passed down to Fosalor before the prophecy was fulfilled. It was a punishment to the Hydro Archon, not to Egeria. Before Egeria died in Sumeru, she gave her authority as the Hydro Archon to Fosalor, thereby giving both title and punishment of the Hydro Archon to her. So Fosalor had to do something about it, not only as the new Hydro Archon, but also as the God of Justice. And in a twist of fate, she, one, managed to break through the rules placed upon the title of being an Archon, two, finding a loophole that the Heavenly Principles themselves won't notice, three, fulfilling the prophecy that Celestia preordained upon Fontaine and its people, and four, also executing her duty as the God of Justice to the people of Fontaine, Celestia, and Egeria, judging all their sins combined in one single trial. Of course, the fourth one is kind of personal, but come on. She did all of that to change the fate of not only Fontaine, but possibly the entire world. This is exactly pointed out by N or Nicole in her dialogue. The prophecy. Yes, what has been prophesied will be fulfilled. You may view such things as the history of the future. People call such things fate, and it is written in the stars. It cannot so easily be altered. Just as prophecies are usually only the future as seen from the perspectives of the gods, could things be happening in hidden corners where the gods' gaze does not fall? Are the things that you shall see different from the fate that the gods perceive? Ultimately, Fate shall serve as your only guide, no matter what will happen in Tavat's future. All you need to do is to play your part. You know, when it comes to prophecies and secrets of the world, the Hexen Circle truly have it all figured out and are just exploiting possibly every world's rules while having a good time in their debauchery tea party. Comment below if you understood that reference. But this also speaks volumes as to how much they understand each world and how much knowledge they've accumulated through their seemingly endless yet finite journey. N or Nicole is the guy that never gets lost who is also a member of the Hexen Circle. And the insight she's given us has never strayed us from our path, even though we ourselves don't even notice it. And she's only the second witch we've sort of seen in action. The other is Alice. And maybe Barbeloth was working in tandem with Nicole in 4.2. Such titles like The Visionary, 
Better Fulnir, Sertology, Gold, Rhine Daughter, and I think the likes of Hex and Zirkle are neither on a level above the gods nor are they the same as the gods, but they're on a level completely on their own. And this was barely explained to us by Skirk, who is way more powerful than the all devouring Narwhal, but is also a disciple of such a being like Sertology, dwelling in a plane of existence simply called the Sea of Stars. Something I find very crucial in Nuvolet's role in the grand play is his decision to either save or destroy Fontaine. If you're wondering how powerful Nuvolet is now compared to before, he's basically as powerful or maybe even more powerful than an Archon is. As an example, one of the things that the Ancient Dragon Authority can do is to make an entire race of half-human, half-Oceanids into full-fledged humans, or if he so wanted to, in a fit of dragon rage, turn them back into full-fledged Oceanids and then dissolving them. Nuvolet's newfound power can basically delete every Fontanian if he still bears the grudge of dragons, which he still does to some degree, just not on humans. This is exactly why Fosalor had to make him understand humanity and their sense of justice first before she gave him full control of his rightful power. Humans, even though they are full of sin, are still worth saving in the eyes of the Archons. Not the gods of Celestia, the Archons. And is something that the Sovereign Dragons have yet to still understand, which is evident in many of the dragons that we've seen since 1.0. And Fosalor wants Nuvolet to understand that ideal so he can make the right choice and save the people of Fontaine, or maybe even the world, and also save Farina, who held off with her performance for 500 years, making sure that no one finds out about Fosalor's secret. Egeria, Forina, and Nuvolet are all connected in this intricate puzzle created by Fosalor herself. If one single puzzle piece of this plan did not fit correctly, Fontaine will be destroyed like all other kingdoms before it, which we've seen happen time and time again. Something else that he also obtained full control over is Fontaine's Numa Ocean energies, meaning that Nuvolet can technically turn off all the mecha in Fontaine or have them destroy everything in Fontaine. Yes, that's how powerful he is now, and is exactly why he needed those 500 years to understand what it means to be human before getting that power. And now, he's got his eyes on the other Archons and waits to judge them for their sin of taking the authority of dragons. Farina is honestly the most inhuman human character that Hoyo ever created. The amount of psychological torture that she voluntarily put herself through to save Fontaine is something that no human can ever be able to do. Yet she is also a crucial, most crucial in my opinion, puzzle piece to changing not only Fontaine's fate but maybe even the world. The entirety of the Fontaine arc was called Masquerade of the Guilty for a reason. Farina, Fosalor, and the people of Fontaine are all guilty, and the Sinner's Curtain Call is the finale that Fosalor planned. Farina's 500 years of self-inflicted torment was the key to deceiving not only Fontaine, thinking she was the Hydro Archon, but more importantly, to deceive the Heavenly Principles while still fulfilling the prophecy with the least collateral damage. Farina was given a choice when she was created as a human binded to Fosalor's divinity, and as the idea human that Farina was, she chose to save Fontaine at the cost of a never-ending masquerade of torment, never telling the secrets of Mirror Me to anyone, not even a spectator like the Traveler, so Fosalor could then save Fontaine. Even if we were given enough time with Farina in that magic box, and as seen in her own scenario, she still wouldn't reveal Fosalor's secret to us, opting to pretend that everything will be okay. Farina herself doesn't even know what the plan was, but she knows Fosalor, and she knows that she needs to pretend to be an Archon. So if she told the Traveler even that small bit of information, then Fosalor's plan to save Fontaine through the prophecy fails entirely. And Fosalor herself said so. Take a listen. So even Farina doesn't know the truth? You've never once let her in on the full plan? Yes, it had to be done. To deceive the heavenly principles, you must first deceive yourself. She did very well. If she had let her resolve falter even once in these five centuries, Fontaine would have been doomed to the most tragic fate. It seems that trusting humanity was the right decision after all. 
So what would happen if Farina did share that secret? Well, I think Fosilor's plan using the history of the future would fail. Nouvellet wouldn't have his full power to then absolve Fontaine's sins because Fosilor is still alive and Fontaine would still dissolve, leaving Farina alone with Fosilor's curse of immortality. If the prophecy was changed, like say Fosilor died and Nouvellet got his authority back, Celestia would then intervene and make the prophecy happen in force. A completely different and more catastrophic prophecy that could possibly lead to the end of the world. A catastrophe that even a sovereign of water wouldn't be able to avoid and will only cause even more destruction in the process. Remember, you can't change fate, but human hearts can. Which is exactly what Nicole says and is what Fosalor aimed for using Forina. Now something interesting and funny I need to say about Child is that the reason for him being guilty is either because he indirectly knows the whale was there because of Skirk and didn't do anything about it at the time, which is very sad, or because Fosalor wanted Child guilty because she knew Child would then end up in the Primordial Sea anyway and fighting the whale because he would hear the whale once he tried to escape the Merope. Very smart for Fosalor to do, or Child is just that unlucky. The all-devouring narwhal is one of the most powerful beings that nearly invaded Fontaine, and it's also Skirk's master's pet. Yep. There are more powerful beings out there that can technically destroy Tavat if they so wanted to. But they can't be bothered with the surface world so they're all chilling somewhere on the other side of the Sea of Stars. Does that name point to the Abyss or the Primordial Sea? Maybe both? I don't know. Skirk as well as the other names she mentioned are all found in Norse mythology, and some of those names refer to certain members of Hexen Zirkel. Skirk can be translated to Skar in Nordic terms, meaning radiant or bright, which is ironic since she is from the Abyss. Visionary being either Nicole or Barbelo, Rhine Daughter, which is Albedo's master, Sirtologi, meaning the fire of Surtur, who is Skirk's master, who also goes by the name of the Fowl, which reflects both Skirk and Child's powers, Foul Legacy, and Vederfolnir, which in Norse mythology is a hawk sitting between an eagle's eyes. The eagle is unnamed and is sitting on top of Yggdrasil. The best answer I could think of is Vanessa after ascending to Celestia, but that would mean that she left Celestia after ascending. If she is part of those names, then that would mean she became a witch of Hex and Zirkel. But that's just me. They could be entirely new names of new characters, which I don't mind at all either more waifus and husbandos. But yeah, Hoyo basically said that there's more in the Abyss than just Conria and the Abyss Order, which honestly I've thought about and theorized before since we saw those Abyss Heralds way back in 1.4. Or 5? Anyway, you just don't worship the Abyss and not think that Conria is the only civilization there. There has to be something more in the Abyss. Now let's talk about Navia since Fossa got flooded first. After the loss of her two best subordinates, Malus and Silver, she currently has almost no one to stand by her side in the Spina di Rosula. She not only lost a cherished family member years ago, but also two subordinates treated like family. But these two subordinates, she may never be able to visit or pay respects to since they basically became one with the hive mind that is Fontaine's waters. Technically, Malus and Silver will always be by her side since they are literally one with Fontaine, and will likely be reborn in some way as another human through the Fountain of Lucine's ritual. But that's not the case anymore so I don't know if they'll ever come back. Honestly, with the amount of sadness and trauma Hoyo is currently embedding into Navia like they did with Farina, I can only hope that her story quest can be a bit happier. But after seeing Fontaine characters' stories, I'm not gonna get my hopes up for the Taylor Swift of Genshin Impact. Risley's Ark was inspired from a floating ship created by King Remus, the god king of old, old Fontaine, Remoria. Manufactured with the help of Edwin Eastinghouse's assistant, Juryu, responsible for its use of Archeum as well as its gravitational functions. But instead of spontaneously combusting like the Fontaine Research Institute, it's a functioning Archeum-powered floating ship. 
Risley funding this ship's creation makes me wonder how much money and power a Duke of the Meropide can have. Not to mention the Meropide is entirely autonomous, thereby separate from the court of Fontaine. I'm curious to see Risley and Farina's interactions at some point, considering Farina really likes the tea he sends her. As for the Meropide itself, however, it seems to have other areas that may be opened up later on, and even more possible secrets that only the Duke and the Udex know about. And there we go, my personal thoughts on the 4.2 Archon Quest, Masquerade of the Guilty. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you did enjoy it, leave a like, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click the bell to stay updated with my content. Again, thanks to Genshin Star for sponsoring this video. So comment below, is Nuvolet going to destroy the world now that he's got all his power, or does Farina get PTSD whenever she looks at the opera Epicles? Now I didn't want to include the Third Descender as well as Natlan in detail yet, because I wanted to put that on a different video that's more about speculation than lore. I also wanted to highlight the three main stars of this dramatic show and the significant roles that they played to save Fontaine. I also just finished the semester with flying colors, so I hope I could make more videos in the meantime. Now then, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!